Bill Barr joins me right now. And Bill, what I've got from reading your book is not just your years with Trump and Bush, but what I got from reading your book is, you know, growing up in, in New York City, you originally wanted to be a CIA guy, mm-hmm. working your way up as a lawyer, and you were heading towards the intelligence area, and then right. you you pivoted over. But you really have a diverse background and a lot of foreign policy knowledge and experience. Right. And I was on the National Security Council. The attorney general was uh, both times I was attorney general. So. so no one has to explain to you the significance of Ukraine. If I was to tell you six weeks ago that when the invasion was about to happen, that the Ukrainians would be fighting and winning in almost every battle in which they fight military to military— and that they be on the they be possible to take down the Russian bear. What would you have told me? I would have been shocked, you know, based on what we were hearing from our own intelligence agencies that it was going to be over in twenty four hours, forty eight hours, and so forth. Uh, but it's been remarkable and inspiring. But the fundamental mistake that was made, and this is the fundamental mistake, is that when Biden came into power, he didn't start arming the Ukrainians. Then that would have deterred the attack. I heard he sent some sh- uh, shipments around mm-hmm. that were en route there. And right. can you think about what's left in Afghanistan? Right. How that could have helped? Right, right. I mean, those weapons, other weapons, uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, weapons that would help him uh, control the sky, uh, Putin would have had to think twice. So when you talk about intelligence, uh, Mark Milley said Ukraine would fall in 72 hours right. and they would lose 15,000 people. Uh, Millie also said now, yesterday, oh, this war could go on for years. Really? Go on for years? There's going to be no women and children left. I mean, you saw what's happened. This is in our lifetime, something we never thought we would allow. And then intelligence officials, on the average, said Ukraine is lucky to last 96 hours. How could we be so wrong again? Right. I'm very skeptical this will go on for years. In fact, if the sanctions are worth anything, what do you think? Are they uh, are they worth? Well, uh, they have to start biting, and if they don't, we have to pile pile on more sanctions. But uh, there's going to be a limit to how much the military, the Russian military, can take, and how much resources they have. They can't have a sustained offensive going on in that country for years. Their their country will not sustain it. You know, um, Brad Velikovich, who's on the ground there, fought uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and now is retired, is helping out on the ground. He says that they're finding Mongolians and Chechnyans and the Wagner group, like dead in the streets. So what does it tell you if they're in action now? There was another draft of, a, you know, April 1st, I guess is draft day in, in Russia. How could a country that size be out of troops or are they? I think they're out, they're out of effective troops and they're, they're scraping around looking for units that they think will perform better like the Chechens and so forth. But it shows you that they do not have the wherewithal for a sustained offensive against the Ukrainians. What worries you most about leaving this job half done, where the Russians keep portions that they already had and maybe more, and we just leave it? Right. What's in our interest is stability in Europe. And uh, once Putin made the decision to do what he did, I think we have to bring this to resolution. We have to make sure that we don't leave behind us a wounded bear who, you know, will be constantly pawing at Europe and tie us up there because we have bigger fish to fry in the Far East with China. China is much more powerful and much more long-term threat than Russia. The good news is NATO understands the threat. We don't have to convince them anymore. Right. How do we make sure we, I don't know anything about this new leader of Germany, for example, they've already taken 15% of their purchase of natural gas. They stopped Nord Stream 2, which is mm-hmm. laudable. Now we have Poland and, and most of the Baltic nations were done with purchasing anything from Russia, including energy. You know what it's like to go to these events and talk to these other leaders. They, they don't, do you think we're past the point of convincing them that Russia is a threat and that we don't have a peace dividend to spend? I think they realize that at this point. And I think things are going to get more complicated because if it looks like Putin's going to be around, you're, you're going to have Finland and Sweden think about joining NATO. Would you let them? I would let those two countries. You know, they're sophisticated uh, countries. They don't have the same kind of corruption problems that they have in Eastern Europe. Well, the the issue was they were told not to. Right. And a nu- and one of these uh, war jets with a nuclear missile, evidently a nuclear armament. Uh, was flown over Sweden. Yeah, the over Russians. The last week. Yeah, the Russians have 
constantly been testing Sweden over the last 10 years, you know, in breaking their uh, their airspace and even naval. All right. Um, I wanted to get your sense of that. But you were there in Bush 41 when the wall came down and Russia was. Right. What was your biggest fear then? Uh, I know it was a feeling of happiness that the Soviet Union was was breaking up. When you guys would, would close doors, would you would you worry about anything? No, you know, at that point, there was, uh, I think the main concern was the durability of what came next. Would they have a stable government or would they descend into chaos and provide an opening for either an extreme right wing or an extreme left wing group to take power in Russia? Um, and uh, we watched, you know, Putin consolidate his autocratic power there over the years. And uh, wasn't the same guy, they say it wasn't the same guy in the beginning. I want right. you to hear from Barack Obama. Uh, he weighed in on, they said, they asked him the question, would this be the same, is this same guy you dealt with? Cut six. I don't know that the person I knew is the same as the person who is now leading this charge. For him to bet the farm in this way, I'm not, I would not have necessarily predicted from him five years ago. Gary Kasparov yesterday, I was listening to a podcast with Megyn Kelly, famous chess player, activist, and said Barack Obama had the worst foreign policy in the history of the U.S. And the weakness that he showed, the apologies that he made, pulling those myth, the missile shield out of Europe and not really coming with hard sanctions after the invasion in 2014 set the scene for this. Yeah, I think that's right. And also he hollowed out our military. Uh, I think President Trump rightly says that when he took office, we didn't even have enough ammunition for minor engagement anywhere in the world. We're running out of ammunition. Uh, so We're cannibalizing planes. Right, right. So he completely, you know, we were the undisputed only superpower when after the wall came down. And it didn't take us long to, you know, to screw that up. And I put most of the blame uh, on Obama. Right. Uh, and then in this president so far? Yeah. I mean, he's he's rolling back the progress we made under uh, President Trump. Trump restored the military and uh, was able to, uh, you know, stand fast with Iran and North Korea and the Chinese. I want to uh, pivot, if I can, to immigration and Title 42. Mm -hmm. what, why was that put in place? To make it uh, well, because of, of uh, COVID, the, the idea was that, uh, you know, we could quickly process and summarily process and send people across the board, back across the Pandemic, border. Pandemic, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. And 84%, if you guys expelled 84% of your people, mm -hmm. the with this in place, the Biden administration has expelled 55%, they claim, let alone the gotaways yeah. and people to get through. Yes. Now, here is a DHS uh, Secretary Mayorkas, um, Homeland Security Secretary, says this is why it's got to go away. Cut 15. It's very difficult to predict what that migration will be, but we are planning for different scenarios. We are then at the border, surging resources. What distinguishes us from the past uh, is the fact that we will not implement policies of cruelty that disregard our asylum laws. We are rebuilding a system that was entirely dismantled. But do you acknowledge you're likely going to see a surge? We very well could, and our job is to be prepared to address it. Yeah, well, that's that's very uh, uh, deceitful because uh, what President Trump did was, uh, by the weight in Mexico problem, he was enforcing the asylum laws. People could come and claim asylum, and it would be processed before they were allowed to come in the United States. The asylum laws were not meant to be sort of a – uh, a world tour ticket where you can sort of walk, go around the world and decide what country you want to end up with. The basis of asylum laws was if you're being persecuted uh, – Can prove it. And can prove it. You're allowed to run into the next country to get sanctuary, first one you come to essentially that will take you. And they have an obligation to take you if you can show you're persecuted. What's actually been happening is uh, all these economic refugees – most of the world lives under our poverty level – and makes you know would make money being on welfare here they'd be better off and they come in and they're coached to say things like you know i'm persecuted and so forth and then we release them into the united states and we never get them again 
It's 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 a, a huge loophole that's been abused, and they are they know what they're doing. The the uh, uh, administration, the Biden administration. What about the put downs? As you said, you uh, the way they the, how he described the laws that were implemented, some of which were there before. Right. Uh, before you got there and, and most after. You went to the Central American countries. Right. That's where Bill Hemmer first caught up with you. I think it was right. your first interview on Fox. Right. Talking to William Barr, host, uh, the author of One Damn Thing After Another. Yep. Uh, the way he's characterizing what you did is you feel as though it's deceitful, but is it? I know you don't take things personal. I've watched you in action. Yeah. But, it, but it is offensive, isn't it? Well, it's, well, it's deeply offensive to the country. Uh, you know, this is an extremely costly endeavor to just open our borders and let people come. We've surrendered control of our border to the cartels, criminal organizations. And now not only people from Central America, but people from all over the world are now going into Mexico because they know they can walk across the border. I mean, it's not whether it's disinformation or, I mean, I don't think the Hunter Biden's um, business relationships have anything to do with who should be president of the United States. So I didn't find I don't find it to be interesting. I mean that that would be my problem with the that as a as a major news story. The editor of the Atlantic at a seminar for University of Chicago students got that question from a freshman about the laptop. Said David Axelrod was doing the interview. William Barr, my uh, guest, one damn thing after another. I'm his. I'm warming up, uh, William Barr, to get ready to go on Gutfeld tonight, <laughs> and uh, so I'm trying to get you ready in the breaks and on air. But, but, uh, and I know this guy, Hunter Biden's got to come up tonight. And can you believe an editor would say that? What does that have to do with running for for Joe Biden being the next president? Yeah, and and the irony is all the hand wringing about so called Russian interference. Yes, they they. Uh, released emails showing that there was... 2016. Uh, yeah. Right, in 2016, showing that there was a, a fight between Hillary and Bernie. You know, big news. That was the interference in the election, right? Embarrassing Hillary that way. This it, it was far more consequential than that. All the, the media platforms and the mainstream media essentially agreeing to keep this out of the news and keep the American people ignorant of business deals... Putting aside the issue of whether there was criminality, I'm not addressing that, but propriety, ethics, the, the you know, cashing in on the office, pretend, potentially giving grounds for blackmail and so forth. Uh, of course, the American people were entitled to know about that before the election. And they say, well, it's disinformation. What about the 51 intel experts from Michael Hayden, served with the Republican administration, to Leon Panetta, some guy that comes off somewhat balanced, former Republican, former CIA director, to Mike Morrell, mm -hmm. all saying this is classic Russian disinformation. You never believed that. And why would 51 people put their, many were very respected, put their name on, on a letter like that? Because they're political whores. And, and it was wrong for them even to put out a letter because they didn't know the facts. They had zero information. They did it as a political ploy to help Biden win the election. You put together cases, but it's all very similar to journalism. I got to mm -hmm. find out what happened here. Right. So let me have, I would look at the emails. And I'd say, I'd call them. Is this your email? Is, is, did you write this? Devin Archer, did you, is it, do you want to stand behind this email? Uh, who's the partner of Hunter Biden? Hunter, right. did you stand behind this email? Naomi is the daughter. An email from Hunter to Naomi. I hope you can do what I did and pay for everything for this family, for the entire family for 30 years. It's very hard. But don't worry. Unlike Pop, Joe, I won't ask you to give me half of your salary. Then Bobolinsky comes out and says 10 percent of these international deals, some with these Chinese companies, one to the big guy, which is Joe Biden. You're a lawyer, legal expert. But if you're a journalist, why wouldn't you pursue those answers? One of the, the funniest things about this whole thing is the media saying we're finally now able to authenticate it. That could have been authenticated within one or two hours. As you say, there are emails there. You call up people, even people who are tangential, and say, "Was this? did you send this email? Yeah. And they'd say yes. And then it would start verifying that this was authentic. And that could have been done quickly. Less than 24 hours, they could have had a good idea whether it was authentic or not. How long did it take them? A year and a half. Yeah. Washington Post said we didn't have the cyber uh, the cyber teams in place to be able to look at this forensically and find out where it came from. Now we see it. Now, 
I mean, I don't. I, sometimes I'm feeling I'm, I'm insulting your intelligence in asking these questions. But we saw this a year and a half ago, at the very least, of the story. And if I'm Hunter Biden, it's not my emails, guys. Not me in the picture smoking crack with hookers. Number two is not my emails, not my laptop. You know that sticker that said Bo Biden Foundation? Not my brother's foundation. But instead, he never answered the question. When, then he goes on a book tour and gets asked by a few comedians. And he basically says, I still don't know to this day if it's that. Yeah. Well, that was all lies. And Biden's statement during the debate was a, was a lie, uh, you know, suggesting it could be Russian, Russian disinformation. And the head of DNI, John Radcliffe at the time, put out a statement saying that there was no indication of Russian Disinformation. Just so you know, she so armed for gut fell later. This is the new development on in the New York Post. This guy Jack Jack Max, he was a partner to Steve Bannon, who got the uh, from Rudy. He got the hard drive from Rudy Giuliani. He has left the country, gone to Switzerland because they found deleted emails and images on the hard drive that they wanted to go to another country to bring forward. So if we got this and these weren't deleted, can you imagine what potentially could be on this laptop when it comes back and these. Deleted emails are dredged up. This story is not close to done, or is it? No, I don't. I don't think it's close to done. Uh, there's, there's probably more coming. If I was to ask you, what's the bigger scandal? The actual business dealings of the potential of president of the United States, former vice president of his family, trading on his name, denying that they ever did, or the media cover up of that so pervasive <laughs> that. Every the one outlet that had it, the watch New York Post had their social media has, uh, suspended, and anyone who retweeted, including the press secretary who you work with, Bill Barr, had while she was suffering from COVID, had her Twitter account suspended for retweeting a story. What is the bigger scandal, or are they equal? Well, w- w- one is relates to a specific situation. The other is, relates to a systemic corruption in the in the media, and they're both very serious problems. And for an editor to say, well, I didn't deem it relevant, I mean, the issue, was it newsworthy? Of course it was new, newsworthy. Whether it's relevant is for the American people to decide. But to keep facts, newsworthy facts from people uh, on the grounds that you didn't deem it relevant, it was relevant, okay? It just, um, I mean, I find it relatively intimidating to be in the news business. Not intimidating, wrong word. Still stunning to this day. To be in the news business and then watch social media with that type of stranglehold leads me to believe that Elon Musk could really be a hero here. He has bought the majority share of Twitter, and now he's on the board. And one of the things he said has been very critical, almost like you or I, about what social media is doing and the way they slant to the left and they decide who to strangle and who not to. Uh, could, this, could, it, could this be the beginning of change? Yes, I hope so. I mean, part of the part of the solution is to have people like Elon Musk, business people, go in and change the direction of some of these big companies. And I hope he does that. I was thrilled when I saw him do what he did. And also in my book, there's a chapter on on big tech and and what's necessary to cut them down to size. Do you want to give us an idea? Well, I think I think uh, there has to be. I don't think antitrust law enforcement is going to be able to deal with the problem in any reasonable time frame. I think they have to be broken up into constituent parts. How do you do that? Well, a company like uh, like Facebook, like Facebook would have to that spin Instagram. off Instagram and Snap. Oh, uh, not uh, Snap, yeah, I think it has uh, Snapchat, doesn't it? Or is Google have Snapchat? Uh, there's another app. I slipped my mind, but uh, what's up? What's up? WhatsApp, uh, you know, they'd have to break off those uh, those companies that they bought over time and put them back out uh, in you know independent entities. Also, I think we have to shift the ownership of the data to the people, to the individual consumer. They have to control their data, not the companies. Uh, that's another part of the solution. The other the other story that uh, you put in process, and you said, "Hey, John Dorham, I, I want you to run this and find out what happened uh, with this whole Russia hoax, the Russia investigation, see where it leads you." And the one thing I took note of is how many people praised John Dorham, including uh, Eric Holder. So this guy's a pretty reputable guy, mm-hmm. and so right. I'm, I'm holding to that. We have those sound bites <laughs> sitting aside. Right. But as he moves forward, he's looking at Michael Sussman, and I flip the channels as soon as Sussman's indictment comes down, and they said, "Small potatoes, really? A, a lawyer out of nowhere? What's that mean?" 
Well, then it turns out that Michael Sussman, and there's even an email that shows this, that to James Baker at the CIA, at the FBI, it says, listen, I'd like to come down. I don't represent anybody. I'll just paraphrase. I'd like to come down and tell you about this really disturbing situation that, that's time sensitive. And what he said essentially was this Trump organization linked to Alpha Bank. So because the Trump Elvis is, is the Alpha Bank, he was concerned as a citizen. But in reality, he was working for Perkins Coie and who were representing the Hillary Clinton campaign, which basically bought the DNC because they were out of money, thanks to Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. So he was representing them. So he seems to have planted some arrangements within the FBI. And next thing you know, he turns around and there's some thought that he talked to Slate and other media outlets and they gave him this story. Jake Sullivan, who was working for the Hillary Clinton camp, puts that in a missive. Maybe the strongest link yet between the Trump organization and Alpha Bank, which is a Russian owned bank. That is retweeted by Hillary Clinton. What's going on here? Well, you know, as I say in my book, the more I found out about this, the more I became concerned that what was going on here was a classic campaign dirty trick where you give bogus and scurrilous information about your opponent to law enforcement in order to get them to investigate it, and then you leak the fact that it's being investigated. And then journal journalists can say, okay, well, we're not really saying it's true. We're just saying it's being investigated. That way you get out the information and you give it credibility because why else would the FBI be investigating? So this led to two questions, both of which I think Durham has been trying to run down, which is what were the motivations of the FBI who jumped on this when they knew that the information was coming from an opposing campaign? And second... Was this, in fact, a a dirty trick where the individuals knew that the information they were giving was false and were doing it in order to uh, leak it to the press and uh, affect the election? Do you know? Do you have a hunch? If the FBI was in on it or being duped like Well, because I was involved in launching the investigation, I don't want to— just between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> it worked for Connie Chung, didn't it? Uh, so, so, yeah, yeah, right. I, is it true that I almost had him? I mean, can we look at this tape again? I, you were you about mean at the to beginning? answer. At the be- no, no, just, oh, now. just now. You were about to answer, I think. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's my biggest question. And I, learned, I don't know if this analogy works because did you ever watch Steve Martin in The Jerk? No. Okay, I know you're too busy. You're working in the White House. So Steve Martin plays a, like uh, a guy who's a moron. And someone's trying to kill him. And he's at a gas station. And wherever he ran, uh, the guy would miss and hit an oil can. And he just ran behind a window and he'd hit another oil can. <laughs> and then he went to the garage and they hit another oil can. He keeps missing him. You know what he said? This guy hates oil. <laughs> so, and I'm going, okay, he's a moron. So are you saying, that, is the FBI going, every, I'm keep getting a little more information. This guy hates oil. Or as opposed to, yeah, I hate Trump too. And uh, there's something here enough to let's let's gum up the works or I got a job to do. The president of the United States might be compromised by Russia. It is my patriotic duty to find out the truth. So I got to raid Roger Stone's house and I got to destroy a uh, Paul Manafort and I got to uh, go into the lawyer for Donald Trump. And I got to take all his records for the good of the country. That's my biggest question. And I'm a guy, as I famously say all the time, I get confused by James Bond movies. I always go, what's happening? What's that knowing look? I don't understand what's next. I don't really follow those mysteries. Murder, She Wrote, I could follow. It was slow enough. It was a Sunday night on at 8 o'clock. But most of this stuff I can't really follow. But as I'm sitting there going, are they patriotically going after somebody that they are convinced to their core is corrupt? Or are they doing something that they just want to destroy a Republican president who they might not personally like? That's the answer I'm looking for. Are you or am I – are you still looking for that answer? Personally, yes, I am looking for that answer and I think Durham is going to do a report. Whether he can give an answer that will uh, prove uh, accurate beyond a reasonable doubt and therefore do it in the context of a criminal prosecution, uh, I don't know. Uh, but that's a very tall order. But he could also write a report where people can judge for themselves from the facts what was going on there. Uh, I've already said publicly I didn't think there was adequate predicate to do what they did. Now, that could have been because – The FBI. Yeah, yeah. But there's two sets of players here. There's there's the uh, FBI and what they did and uh, uh, there is the uh, Hillary Clinton campaign. And what they did, knowing all along. And the theory is that when these emails got released and uh, who, who hacked them, 
It, it looks like John Podesta clicked on a link that allowed them to infiltrate his emails, and they released those emails through some type of cyber attack, and it got into the public mainstream. And to get to, to smother that, you create a firestorm with your opponent, the Republican named Donald Trump, and create some dicey business ties with Russia to try to overwhelm her emails that shows that she was acting at the very least haphazardly as secretary of state by using her personal devices and everything like that. Yeah. Well, that's that, you know, that's the theory that that's a theory that's being advanced, but that the reason I, uh, brought in Durham, uh, was to answer the question that you laid out Were the FBI acting in good faith. Cause they really thought there was a threat was the Hillary Clinton campaign operatives really think there was a threat here and they were just being good citizens, you know, blowing the whistle on the threat. Or was this all part of a, a campaign dirty trick? And that's the question Durham has to answer. Lastly, mm-hmm. you know what it's like to be not not under investigation, but give it. When the doors close in Delaware and the White House, do you think there should be and is legitimate worry? Judging by what you've seen so far with the Hunter Biden laptop and things like that and the possible business connections that we all know exist. Tony Bobulinski and others to come forward. And when the doors close in Hillary Clinton's house among the for his former officials, even Jake Sullivan, who was part of the Hillary Clinton campaign, do you think they're nervous that Dorm's getting close and that the media is getting close with Biden? Do you think you mean I, on, the, on, the hunter, your, your on Hunter feeling, laptop? Would you be nervous when those doors closed if that was you I, I, off of bo- in both those situations? And, I, well, I, I think they're probably nervous uh, to have – to have yeah. these investigate, you know, to have these investigations still grinding away, I think they're nervous. But again, there's a distinction between whether there's real criminal exposure or just whether the facts that will ultimately come out are just very embarrassing. But either way, I think they would be nervous. I would think so. Um, but yet, Hillary Clinton's out. And I think she might even run again. Uh, Bill Barr. It's uh, the name of the book is One Damn Thing After Another. Uh, we got to get this back to number one. <laughs> and I think he might bring a legal suit against me because I kind of promised off the record, but I have I'm with four microphones, <laughs> that I would make him number one again. And we'll get you back on the weekend show, One Nation. Uh, but, Bill, congratulations. The book is really it's fascinating because you bring us through so many administrations with your career, but you would never, because you're so stone faced and we have that game face on. I have no idea. Well, America's going to get to see the sense of humor of William Barr. Are you concerned about that? You mean tonight on tonight, Jeff? Yeah, on Jeff yeah, I'm concerned about it. You're, you're concerned. Yeah. Yeah. You're concerned. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.